All right, here's solutions to problem 55 off the math subject GRE practice test. Um, so you're told A and B are positive numbers and you have to evaluate this integral. So a few options. I mean, you can evaluate this integral, what a, I think a U substitution or maybe a couple of them will do the trick. Um, that seems like a lot of work. I mean, if it was a homework problem, maybe that's a great method, but in the time pressure of a test, that might not be the best way to go. So I guess what I'm saying is you have lots of options on a problem like this. Um, one option would be to kind of eliminate some choices, see what you can eliminate, and then maybe you've narrowed it down to a few, and at that point you just kind of guess and check, like, this answer is not zero. Well, okay, let me show you what you can do. Um, a and B can be any positive numbers you want. So they could be the same positive number, for example. If A and B are the same positive number, like they're both one maybe, then the numerator here is zero, but the denominator is non-zero, so the integral from zero to infinity of zero is just zero. What I'm saying is that B can't possibly be the answer because the answer is not one for any possible choices of A and B. Um, the answer is not independent of your choice of A and B. It's not equal to one. Uh, because I just showed a specific choice for A and B that made the answer zero. So I can kind of say if A equals B here. Unfortunately, we can't eliminate any other choices because if A equals B, this answer would be zero, this answer would be zero, and this answer would be zero. Um, okay, so what if, maybe I can eliminate zero as an answer. What if A is greater than B? If A is greater than B, then the numerator here is positive and the denominator is positive because X ranges from zero to infinity. So I'm taking the integral from zero to infinity of something that's always positive, so therefore the answer would be positive, so the answer sure as hell ain't zero. Um, but unfortunately, if A is greater than B, all of these are positive numbers. So I can't eliminate any other. So I guess I've narrowed it down to three. So at this point, you could just take a wild ass guess if you felt like it. Um, if I were to do that, I'd probably guess D, and unfortunately I would be wrong. I'd come up with D because I note that there's a log two in two of these answers, so that probably wasn't thrown in there for no reason. Um, so then I kind of look and well, these two are similar, um, but this one's got the log two. I kind of like D, turns out that's not right. Uh, so anyways, one option, eliminate answers. Maybe you could eliminate more if, if uh, I don't know, a is two and B is one, or, or maybe a better way to go about this is to kind of use some limits. So what if A is one and uh, B is getting really, really small. So uh, the limit as B approaches zero from the positive side or something, maybe you can figure out what would happen here and see how that uh, aligns with these answers here. And I think I read somewhere online where people use limits and were able to solve this, able to eliminate these different answers. Uh, another option, it would just be to integrate, bite the bullet, do the work. Maybe you've gone really fast through everything else and you want to integrate, or maybe you don't, but for the sake of studying, you want to see how you would integrate something like this. Okay, so maybe I'll integrate this thing up here. Let's see, I want to figure out what is the integral from zero to infinity of e raised up to the ax power minus e raised up to the bx power divided by one plus e to the ax times one plus e to the bx. Bx. Uh, and one trick, one way you can do this is if you recognize that what you have up in the numerator is one plus, if I add one and subtract one from the numerator, I get one plus e to the ax power minus one plus e to the bx power. So that's all over one plus e to the ax, one plus e to the bx. I'm gonna put unnecessary parentheses right here just to help see what's going on. I added a one and a negative one, uh, but now what I have are these two terms up in the numerator. So I can break this up into two different fractions. And the advantage of doing so is the first one will be this thing over the entire denominator but this term will cancel with this, or factor will cancel with this factor right here. So I will get one over one plus e to the bx power minus one over one plus e to the ax power, because the second term would be this thing, divided by all of these, but I cancel out this, and I'm left with just this. That gets me here. Okay, so what the hell is this thing equal to? I mean, I guess it's a little bit prettier than what I had originally, but it's still some work to do. So I'll do some work. Uh, maybe off to the side, let's figure out the integral from, let's not even, let's just figure out 
1 over 1 plus e to the, I don't know, bx, I guess. bx, let's figure out what this is equal to. Well, the trick here is I could add e to the bx as long as I subtracted e to the bx from the numerator. And then I'm not changing any values. Uh, but the advantage of this, and again with the unnecessary parentheses, you might be able to see that if you view this as two terms, this guy and this guy, you could split this up as 1 minus e to the bx divided by 1 plus e to the bx dx. The of this form is I can split this up into two different integrals, I guess, and then call this one x. And for this one, I can do a u substitution. I can let u equal 1 plus e to the bx, and then du would be equal to be to the bx because the derivative of 1 is 0, and the derivative of e to the bx using the chain rule is e to the bx times b, this thing. So therefore, 1 over b times du is equal to e to the bx dx. Uh, so what I have here is e to the bx dx, which is exactly 1 over b du. And then uh, what's left is the 1 over 1 plus e to the bx, which is what I'm calling u. So I get here. On uh, this one, let's see, that's uh, 1 over b is a constant, and the antiderivative of 1 over u is the natural log of u. But u is the natural log, uh, the natural log of u is the natural log of 1 plus e to the bx. Okay, so all that work, now what I know is this first guy here, it's antiderivative is this thing. And similarly, this second guy here is antiderivative would, would be this thing, except it's negative and I got an A in place. Uh, so what I'm saying is I want to figure out, maybe switch colors again. Uh, to evaluate this, we take the integral from zero to some letter, C maybe, because I'm already using A's and B's. And let's see, go towards infinity. So what I want is the limit as c approaches infinity of, uh, from this first guy, I get this, x minus 1 over b natural log, let's just, yeah, I'll leave it like that, oops, natural log of 1 plus e to the bx, all right, that's this, turns into this, and then from that I want to subtract, and then I'd get this exact same thing except in place of all the b's there'd be a's. Something like this. Uh, and what I want to do is evaluate this thing from 0 to C. So maybe you'll recognize that x minus x, that cancels out. So what I have left is positive 1 over A natural log of 1 plus E to the AX minus 1 over B natural. Okay, so let me write it. Limit as C approaches infinity of 1 over A natural log 1 plus E to the AX minus 1 over b natural log of 1 plus e to the bx. I want to evaluate this from 0 to c. And just so I have room to do it, maybe I'll write it down here. Let's change all the x's into c's first. So I got 1 over a natural log of 1 plus e to the a times c minus 1 over b natural log of 1 plus e to the b times c. Uh, so that's this thing if I plug in C's, and from that I want to subtract this thing if I plug in zeros. So if I plug in zeros, uh, 1 plus e to the 0 power is just 1 plus 1, which is 2. So I get 1 over a times the natural log of 2. The same idea over here. I get 1 over b times the natural log of 2. And this is the limit as c approaches 0. Sorry, C approaches infinity. C approaches some. Okay, so for this first term here, well, let's do the second term first. That's easier. Um, factor out a natural log of 2. And what I would have is 1 over A minus 1 over B. You're like, wait, that looks familiar. Hey, that looks a lot like this right here. Yeah, okay, slow down. 
Uh, let's evaluate this limit. How do you evaluate this limit? Um, I don't know, maybe there's an easier way, but one way you could do it would be using log rules. I could take this one over A and bring it up into the exponent here on my log. Same thing here. And then I'd have the log of something minus the log of something else. And so I can change that into the log of the quotient. What I'm saying is I can rewrite this as the limit as C approaches infinity of natural log 1 plus E to the AC power the natural log of 1 plus e to the ac power raised up to the 1 over a power divided by 1 plus e to the bc power raised up to the 1 over b power. So I get this thing. Uh, so what is this limit equal to here? Well, um, these ones don't really matter. All right, one bigger than this huge number doesn't really matter. Uh, so you can kind of think about it like it's e to the ac to the 1 over a. But e to the ac to the 1 over a, I'd multiply together those two exponents. So e to the ac times 1 over a leaves me with e to the c power. So really, 1 plus e to the c power, but ignore the 1. This limit's equal to that limit. And then you got e by the same logic to the c power on the bottom. So what I get is the limit as c approaches infinity of the natural log of the number 1 minus the natural log of 2, 1 over a, 1 over b. Natural log of 1, that's just 0. So this is just equal to the negative of the natural log of 2 times 1 over a minus 1 over b, which is equal to um, the negative of natural log of 2 times, if I get a common denominator, a times b, I would have b minus a over a, b. If I don't want that negative sign floating around, can distribute it through the parentheses, make this b negative and this a positive. So I get a minus b over a b, which sure enough is exactly what we have written here. Um, there's another way you can solve this thing, and I know I'm kind of beating this thing to death, but I read this online and I want to give props to whoever came up with this. There's this clever solution. Uh, and the idea is view this thing as a function. So let's let f of a, B, so a function of the variables A and B. Um, let's make this equal to the integral from zero to infinity of E to the AX minus E to the BX over one plus E to the AX, one plus E to the BX. So all I'm doing is rewriting this thing in function notation and note that it's a function of both A and B, the values of A and B, and A and B are both non-negative, or I guess positive in this case numbers. Okay, so if this is a function of a and b, I can do a substitution. So I can let u equal any number that I want, maybe 2. Let's let u equal 2x. So if u equals 2x, then du equals 2dx. So I can rewrite this thing, and... Um, I could say that this is equal to, or maybe I'll go over here, this is equal to the integral from zero to infinity. Note that I'm not changing my bounds on that. Um, but then instead of writing, wait, I want 2u to equal x. Well, I guess that doesn't matter. Shoot. Uh, let's let 2u equal x here just to make it easier so I don't get fractions. Uh, if 2u equals x, then... Uh, And I'd have 2d8, oh, I'm just making this so hard to read. Okay, if 2u equaled x, then 2du would equal dx. So then what I would be writing over here would be the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the, and then instead of a times x, I would want a times 2u, so maybe 2au, minus e to the 2bu. If you don't see where I'm going, you're not supposed to. Um, I sure as hell didn't see where this guy was going when I read this online. 2AU, 1 plus E to the 2BU. Uh, and then I said DX, I want 2DU. So all of this to say that I now have this constant 2, so I can make this 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of, I can leave everything else the same in here. But what you'll note is if everything else is the exact same, then it looks a hell of a lot like this thing right here, except in place of A and B, 
I can think about it as having 2a and 2b. So what I'm saying is f of a, b is equal to this thing. That's equal to 2 of 2 times f of 2a, 2b. All right, so this has got to be the exact same as this. If I change all the a's and b's into 2a and 2b's, um, well, this answer will be exactly twice this answer right here. You're like, so what? How does that help me? Well, see how that works with these different answers, right? If I, if this were my answer right here, a minus b, two, and I go, it's, how should I do this? Let's do it this way. Two times, and then everywhere I see an a, I want to replace it with a two a, and everywhere I see a b, I want to replace it with a two b, I get this right here. But this is supposed to be equal to f of a, b, but it's not. f of a, b, uh, the solution is presumably a minus b, as it says here. So these are not the same, so that can't possibly be my answer. Same idea here, uh, 2 times f of 2a comma 2b would be 2 times 2a minus 2b natural log of 2. And that is not equal to this answer d here, a minus b natural log of 2. So that's not my answer either. What you'll see is over here it does work. Over here I would get, I want 2 times, 2 for this 2 right here. And then instead of a, b, a, and b, I'm going to replace all those with 2a's and 2b's. So I get 2a minus 2b divided by 2a times 2b times the natural log of 2. But wait a minute, I could factor out a 2 here. And then this 2 and that 2 gives me a 4, but I also have a 4 down on the, bot on the bottom. That's the exact same as a minus b divided by ab natural log of 2. And this is exactly f of ab. So the only answer that makes f of ab the exact same as 2 times f of 2a 2b is this answer e right here. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't have thought of that. Whatever. Somebody could solve it that way. It's clever in retrospect. I don't know if that would help me on a test, but there you go. It's one more way to solve this pretty challenging problem.